This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we take a closer look and dig a little deeper into this week's sermon. What's going on, man? Oh, not much. I'm uh, doing well. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, Did a lot of work on the trailer today. Good. Yeah. Getting close? Uh, Closer. (laughs) You know how it goes. Yep. Um, uh, so, So walk us through your sermon for this past week. Yeah, so I'm really excited about this. Um, This past week was the first week of our new series that I'm titling Because of Faith. Okay. Because I think we all know conceptually that faith, faith is something. Right. But I'm not sure if we know exactly what it is. And what relation, what relationship it has to our Christian experience? Oh. Um, because you know you hear people say faith is the opposite of doubt, or faith is not the same thing as believing. Uh, you know, you hear people say all these things to try to define it, and I think that's helpful until it's not right. Um, because you know, we see the disciples at the end, like Matthew 28 at the great commission, right? Jesus takes them on the mountain and they've, they've already touched him. They've already seen that he's like been resurrected. They know it's him. And the text says right before the great commission and some believed and some were doubting. Mm. It's like, okay, but they all go and do things because we, we have acts, right? So we know that they all go do something. So, those kind of definitions and categories work until they don't because some are believing and some are doubting, which seem to be in contradiction to one another. And yet they all end up going and doing something. And so I don't think doubting in and of itself is a bad thing. Right. Right. It's quite healthy to have doubts at times. Uh, It means that you're a normal human being. Right. And so as I was wrestling with this, like what, what actually is faith? Um, and you know, we have these famous texts like Hebrews 11 by faith, uh, this happened. It's like, okay, but what really is this? And what, what really does it mean for our Christian life, our experience of faith, our, our spirituality, our, um, potentiality for healing? Yeah. Uh, what really is faith? And so we're going to do four part series on faith. Uh, and I'm titling it because of faith, because I think there's these really four unique stories in the Gospels where something happens because of faith. Mm. Um, and it's unique. I'm not I don't think I'm going to preach this uh, text, so I'll go ahead and say it. But there's a couple of times in the Gospels where it says because of their lack of faith, Jesus couldn't perform any miracles there. It's like, okay, there seems to be some relationship to our having faith and the divine intervention meeting. And it's like, God always has the capacity for divine intervention, but it has to be in a place that has faith. Yeah. It's like, so the miracle or the supernatural happens at the intersection of both our faith and the power of God. And we see this in Matthew 9. This is in a really weird story where Matthew's joined these kind of two experiences together where we have um, the official coming to Jesus and talking about his daughter dying. Mm. And as Jesus is talking to him um, and sending him on his way with the disciples... This is in Matthew 9, beginning of verse 19. It says, Jesus got up, and he and his disciples went with the man. But as they were heading to the man's house, a woman who'd been hemorrhaging and bleeding for 12 years, 12 years, crept up behind Jesus. 
Okay, so, and it's not super clear what uh, or how to translate that word that we're translating here, hemorrhaging. Right. Um, she has some kind of open sores all over her body that are bleeding quite heavily, quite profusely. Yeah. Um, really, really difficult Greek to translate there. But she seems to have some kind of skin defection or like mm-hmm. skin deficiency that allows her her pores to bleed. Right. Or at least some of them or some kind of sores to arise on her. And so this story happens right in the intersection, like right as this other miracle story is happening. And it's interesting that there's an official that comes to Jesus face to face. Mm-hmm. And he says, my daughter needs help. So Jesus and his disciples go with him. And then there's this woman who literally she's like creeping in the background. She's, she's a marginalized person. Yeah. Um, First of all, she's a woman and also she's sick. Yeah, and with a blood issue, which probably yeah. means she's very weak as well. Right. And you're constantly losing blood like that. I mean, you don't have a whole lot of energy and strength. And so you have this conflict or this contrast of this powerful man, this official, with this marginalized woman. No. Yeah. And the man meets Jesus face to face. But the woman creeps in the background. The man's position gives him a status and a position of power where he can talk to Jesus face to face. But the woman, she knows that she can't do it. Yeah. She knows it's not a place she can take. And so she creeps up behind Jesus. And like as the story's unfolding, it, it feels quite sinister. Right, there's this woman who's bleeding, like we're not sure what's happening to her. She's creeping up behind Jesus. What what's happening? And it says, and so she came up behind him and touched his cloak. Mm. Huh. Okay. This is an interesting twist. This is not what I expected in the story. She touches his cloak. And Jesus turns around and sees her. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, I want you to picture this. Jesus and his disciples are walking with this high official, right? Um, And they're on a mission. His daughter has just died. Yeah. And he's come to Jesus to help heal her. So they're on this mission and they're going and going. And this woman comes up and grabs or touches his cloak and he he feels her um i think the actual verbiage is he feels the power leaving him well that's in a that's in a different oh, that's okay. in like one of the other renditions of the story okay that's in one of the other gospels. yeah that's not what okay. matthew says here but so he turns around and he tells her take heart daughter your faith has healed you. Hmm. And indeed, from that moment, the woman was healed. And so, I think there's this, there's this element here, I'm glad you bring up the other scripture where it says, and he felt the power leave him. I think that's in uh, Luke's version of the story. He felt the power leave him. And so, she touches him, And Jesus doesn't, according to Luke anyways, Jesus doesn't cognizantly or actively heal her. Mm -hmm. Like it's not something he intentionally did. Right. But she goes up and she's using presumably quite a bit of energy for a woman who's hemorrhaging blood to touch his cloak, like going above and beyond because of her faith. She believes that if she could just touch the end of his cloak, that she will be healed. And Jesus turns around and affirms her. Your faith has healed you. And so, what does this actually mean? That 
she, her faith has healed her. Well, partly it means that Jesus oozes healing, right? It's like, it's natural to him. It's not something that's difficult for him. But it's almost like, it's almost like the that faith is needed on the other end for it to stick. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like Jesus can ooze restoration. And I think this is where like the universalist language comes from. Like Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. So like there's restoration oozing for everyone. If you have faith. To- the question yeah. is, is there the faith on the other end to receive it? That's a good thought. That's a really good thought. Yeah, it's almost like um it's like I don't know how to explain it. It's like everyone has a capacity for healing and wholeness. Yeah. But it's a question of do you have faith that it's real? Yeah. Um you know the the second half of that story with the official and the daughter, mm-hmm. right? Um uh, you and I did talk about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't, I don't know if we talked about it on one of the podcasts or not, but um, we talked about how uh, N.T. Wright, uh, his interpretation of that story um, is that um, he, the the official submitted to the authority of Jesus, right? Okay. And in the same way, so did the woman, right? Her faith in submitting to the authority and power of Jesus. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so I think that there's something there. I um, think, yeah. So Like th- understanding the power of Jesus and submitting to it. Yeah, I think I might, I would have to read Tom's argument a bit more, mm-hmm. but I think at surface level, I might disagree with him. Oh, I think the purpose of putting them together and in contrast is to show that the gospel is literally for the entire social structure, Mm. the top and the bottom. Um, It's not just for the bottom or just for the top. It's not just for the insider or the outsider. It's not an us versus them experience. Yeah. It's for everyone. Um, And it, it shows two different people, right? One person having faith for another and one person having faith for themselves. Um, it is possible that there are multiple purposes for a text, though. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, for sure. But I think for me here, as I'm thinking about it, excuse me, what, what does this mean for your everyday life? No. Right. What what is faith in this regard? Well, faith is your part of the equation. If if the equation, if the desired outcome of the equation is healing and wholeness, God's part is power. No. Your part is faith. Uh, and without both sides, it's unlikely that you're going to experience wholeness. It's not to say that God can't do it in spite of your faith. I think he could. Yet, I also find it highly unlikely he will. Um, it's almost as if faith is the secret sauce. Mm. It's like if God is all-powerful... And Jesus came, right? God so loved the world. He came for everyone. Yeah. But yet we still have this talk of sin and death and destruction, and we have experiences of evil. It's almost as if faith is the secret sauce. It's the golden ticket. Yeah, it's it's the glue that holds it together. Well, not necessarily holds it together, but like it, it makes, it actually makes it happen. Mm. It's almost like it doesn't happen without the faith. Um, and as we're going to see through the rest of our series, um, this happens numerous, like a number of times that there's this language. B 
because of faith or your faith has made you well or your faith has healed you. Um, it's almost as if without any faith, they wouldn't be healed. And so as I think about faith today, I think we have two big gaps of faith. Number one, I think we have a limited faith in what God can actually do. But yet I also think we have a limited faith of ourselves, mm. that we're worthy of healing and wholeness. Yeah. Um, and so if we, if we were going to define faith, I'm going to define faith as the expectation that God's power can meet my vulnerability. I think for me, that is the true definition of faith, that I am expecting that there's a powerful God that is capable of meeting me in my vulnerability. And if that's true, my vulnerability has two parts. Like you talked about, submitting to the authority of God, that he is powerful, but also being vulnerable to a place that I think I'm worthy to experience healing. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there, there are lots of people that struggle with that. This, this idea of, of self-loathing, my yeah. sin is so bad. Um, I've been there, right? I know you've been there as well. Um, yeah. My sin is so bad that God can't save me. God can't love me. Right. When, and I was thinking about this actually last night, if, um, if our sin was the defining factor of being worthy to pursue, um, God's kingdom, nobody would be in God's kingdom. Right. Yeah. Clearly God doesn't care about your sin. I mean, he cares, but he loves you enough and gives you grace through it. Right? Yeah. It's like, um, God's not shocked at the level of sin in your life. No. Um, no. I mean, look at Paul as a great example, right? Yeah, Paul is a great example. I think an even greater example is this, the parable of the prodigal son. Oh, yeah. I mean, the youngest son literally goes to his dad and says, hey, can you give me my inheritance? Which, what does, he, what does that really mean? I, I hope you die. I <laughs> wish you were dead so I could just have your money. And then he goes away and spends it all. And when he comes back, the dad rejoices that he's back. Yep. It's like nothing that you can do ruins that for you. Yeah. Um, and I think part of the problem that we have here in this is that in a lot of traditions, and I'm going to credit um, the Liturgist podcast with helping me in my formation of this, but in a lot of traditions, we just continually tell people they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad because of their sin. Like they're just terrible human beings. They're just lumps of crap that we're just grateful that God re chose to redeem us as pitiful human beings. It's like, why, why wouldn't you feel worthy versus maybe a better narrative than that? is that you're a person loved by God, made in the image of God, and designed for fellowship because you're created in his likeness. Yeah. Like maybe that's a much better narrative than you're a terrible person that's lucky that God has chosen you. Mm. Um, like, or that God is this wrathful God that's just pissed off at all of our sin and so he sends his son to die in our place to appease his anger. Yeah. Like maybe those are not helpful. Well, they're definitely not. Um, and I, I if I'm going to be honest, um, having heard that um, at, in a place where I believed it and also in a place where I was didn't, believe that right yeah. um i was hurt you know 
whenever I, I believed it and I've I like internalized that. Right. I'm, I'm a piece of crap. Right. Right. And then when I was in a place where I didn't believe that, it made me angry. That that narrative existed? Yeah. Yeah. It made me incredibly angry. Yeah. Because think of how many people are hurt by that narrative. Right. Yeah. It's detrimental to a lot of people. Um, when in reality, it might be more person first. Right. Yeah, for sure. You are a beautiful creation in the likeness of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so I think, you know, faith, the faith gap, as we would call it sometimes, I think is two parts. One, believing in the authority and power of God. Yeah. For sure. For if if faith is the expectancy that God's power is going to meet your vulnerability, whatever your vulnerability is, if it's mental health, if it's physical illness, if it's relationships, if it's finances, whatever your vulnerability is, you have to believe, you have to have faith that God is powerful enough to overcome that. Yeah. And so lots of times we get in places where we struggle thinking that God is powerful enough to get like get us out of this. Yeah. Um, but I think to another p- part and maybe the bigger piece that is more often we can't jump our own faith gap that we're worthy of God's power to meet our vulnerability. Yeah. And so in the faith equation, the expectancy is lost, not because it's God's side. Right. We expect that God's powerful enough but we can't believe that we are worth it. Yeah. Um, and to, to tie it into something that we talked about, um, I don't, when this comes out, I don't know how long ago we talked about it, but on Pints and Perspectives when we talked about um, John 14. Um, yeah, I don't know, dude. That's yeah. been a, that we've recorded it, a lot of podcasts. We've recorded a lot since then. Um, but um, the idea... Um, that is also presented in that chapter. That wasn't what we were talking about, but um, around the same idea that, um, and we will do greater things than Jesus did, right? Or Jesus expects us to. Um, yep. Following that up, he also says, and whatever you ask in my name, I will do. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. Obviously not selfish desires for yourself, or just slapping in Jesus' name on the end of a prayer, right? But asking for forgiveness, asking for deliverance in the name of God. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, that's it's a really weird thing because we do have that story where Jesus says, whatever. Anything, anything. And then we also have, if someone has the faith of a mustard seed, they can say to that mountain, move. Right. Well, why would anyone do that? Mm. What's the purpose of saying to a mountain to move? It would only be selfish. It would be a test, right? It's throwing out a fleece. Um, it could be um, it could be a metaphor that Jesus is using for anything the size of a mountain, right? Right that that you need. But I do think the 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 thing that I want our listeners to understand and hear is twofold. You are good. Like at your core, you are good because you are made in the image and likeness of God. Amen. Um, You are wholly good and designed for good. Amen. Second, The faith gap is an expectancy gap Mm. that you either have a lack of expectation of the power of God or you have a lack of expectation that you're worthy of goodness, wholeness, and healing. And if that is you, you are 110% worthy of healing and wholeness and restoration.